down partly cloudy skies, 75 degrees, the humidity is 63 percent, but we have little chance for any more rain. We had a little bit earlier in the day. Mount Davis, as we mentioned, a bit of a homecoming for him, having spent many years as a high school coach in Portland, as well as at the helm of Portland State. And the likable Dick Corey, the coach of the Portland Breakers, who has shown his class by bringing on a club that really had no chance the last few weeks of the season. Harv is always done so easy in this ball game. What are they? Well, I'll tell you, so far as the uh, Denver club is concerned, they really have to put pressure on the passer. They've got a great pass rush, and Portland's offensive line is banged up. They need that effective running game with Billy Harrison to balance their offense, and they can't turn it over in their own territory because Portland is unable to go the long way on pass history. For Portland, they have to have their running game. Buford Jordan can help give them that. No big play by that potent Denver offense, and they've got to win the kicking game. They've got the better kickers, but Denver has great kick return men, and Portland has not covered well this year. There's Jim Mazzetti, one of those fine kickers that you mentioned. Lonnie Harris is back. He's second in the USFL in kickoff return. Brad Caleb is also back there with him, along with Nate Harris. Taken in by Lonnie Harris. He found a seam. He's up to the 35. First descends with a goal from that point. Good field position for Denver here at the outset. Offensively, here's the way Denver will look with Bob Galliano as quarterback. And he posted some good numbers. Of course, he did throw a number of interceptions last week. Now up front for him, Tom Davis will be the center. The guards will be George Jarno and Mike Heath. Greg Loberg and Matt Miller will be the tackles. The wide receivers are Ronnie Turner and Mark Lewis, the slot back Leonard Harris and Joe Siegel, Bill Johnson in the backfield. Siegel in motion on first and ten. He's got it. Siegel out of bounds at the 45. Here a first down. They will mark it beyond the 45. That's the same pattern that was used so well by Denver a couple of weeks ago against Los Angeles. Joe Resnick knocked him out of bounds. Defensively, Portland looks this way. A three-man front, but they'll use four guys up front from side to side. Frankie Wilson and Jeff Merrill are the end. Gerald Bayless will be the nose tackle. The linebackers outside, Greg Shore and Ben Needham. Robert Pennywell and Marcus Merritt will be inside. We'll set the corners and safety for you in a moment. Second play for Denver. Galliano with plenty of time. Just beyond the outstretched arms, a Lonnie Turner. And boy, was he open. Back there with him, Lindell Jones and Joe Rustic, but they were both soundly beaten as you look at Miles Davis. Turner took an inside break on the play, which meant at the corner, Lindell Jones turned him over to the inside safety, and there's a real mismatch there. Joe Rustic with a fine defensive back does not include speed as one of his uh, number one attributes. Turner outran it. Galliano last week. But look at that, three interceptions. That was his only problem, and they came inside Houston 20 every time. Lindell Jones and Bruce Miller are the cornerbacks. Joe Rustic and Tommy Haynes, the safeties for Portland. Little quick hit pattern taken in by Leonard Harris. And he is Jalak Hart. It was Tommy Haynes and Needham that were in on the stop. Also, Greg Shore, the linebacker. Secondary with Joe Restick moving over. He's the defensive man, and Blue moving is just in his zone. Restick stays shallow, and he comes up, converges on Johnson, which caught the screen pass, turns him back into all the pursuit. And even though he does a lot of running, Greg Shore gets in under his feet and fills him for a gain of a yard on the play. So that sets up third down and long. Third and nine coming up for Denver now. <laughs> Three-man front for Portland. Galliano in trouble, and down he goes. Gerald Bailey. Galliano sprints out away from the way directly in set motion. You see him, he felt he Bayless there and looked back, and as a result, wasn't reading his covers as he should. Bayless just kept pouring on in there and was able to beat George Yano finally. The left guard took over from the center on that protection, and they forced along the other situation on a fourth down punish situation. As was in the punch, 
averaging 38 on the year. You know Hall dropped back east. You remember that name, of course, from Cleveland and the NFL. <laughs> in his track, did get away from Nate Harris, but Keith Mitchell came down to get him the man up front, the deep snapper as a matter of fact, and it will be first down at 10 for Portland with the ball at the 33-yard line. Asmus missed that one just a bit. And Robinson comes into the game, there are his offensive numbers, and up front for him, Roger Lavasso will be the center, Roderick Thompson and Frank Roberts will be the guards. Randy Vander here and Dan Hurley will be the tackle. Dan Ross, the tight end, that's their biggest weapon. Johnson and Brown are the wide receivers. And Hubert Jordan now the lone set by. Jackson, the other running back who was in a slot, the intended receiver. The pass is completed at second and ten. Matt Robinson will face this defense from Denver that has bent but not broken during the course of the year. Up front, Bruce Thornton and Calvin Turner at the end. Josh Nicholas and Pat Ogren will be the tackles. The linebackers are a good group. Stan Blinkett, John Nevins, and Mike McGibbon. Nate Miller is back in the starting lineup in one corner. Lance Shields the other with Steve Trimble and Darrell Hemphill the station. Second down and ten. That's Jackson, Lewis Jackson beyond the 35 to about the 36 yard line. In the arms of John Nevins, the middle linebacker. Gate of three, we'll call it third and seven coming up. You know, in the first play, they clankered their fullback out wide, trying to hit him on a hip pass, wanted to get the strong safety to cover the fullback. Nolan Franz is coming to the game. The wide receiver at the top of his screen. Out of the shotgun. Rod and Trent for Brown incomplete. Overthrown, probably a good idea because that is not that it may have been picked off. It will be fourth down for the breakers and they'll be fourth to five. There was a free safety back in the middle, deep, and that allowed Darrell Hemphill, who was covering the intended receiver, to play underneath him. He could allow the receiver to get behind him because he had backup help, but he could get a lot of interceptions covering that way. Yep, got it. Who punted for Marv Levy for a few years. Back to part four. The Breakers. Lonnie Harris is awaiting for Denver. Harris takes it in at a 17. He did the side roll back. Up to near the 40-yard line. They'll mark it at the 38, and that's where Denver will pan for its goal when we return to Portland in a moment. Welcome back to Portland, everyone. Tim Brando and Marv Levy, we're happy you joined us for ESPN Action. It's Friday night. Just underway, 11.35 to play in the first quarter. Johnson in the game, the lower setback, and a running shoot against Siegel in motion. Siegel is wide open. No one within 15 yards of it. And he's out of bounds inside the Portland 40 at the 37. That had to be a mistake. I'm going to speculate on Bruce Miller's part. It was a zone defense, and Miller should have had the short zone, but he dropped deep. Diano sprinting to his left, looking here, doesn't like what he sees, looks back, has all the time in the world. There, take a look at Siegel. There is no one within literally 25 yards of him on the play. The zone had dropped deep on the other side, which made me believe that Miller could have rolled up on his side. Siegel broke a record a couple of weeks ago. Most receptions in a single game of the USFL against Los Angeles. He already had two tonight. Johnson. Well, he put a shoulder in Marcus Merrick and also in the other linebacker that was up front, Anywell, and continued to move them backwards. Game four, it'll be second and six. This is their trap play. Diano pivots away from the direction they're going to run the trap. Johnson will see break a tackle right there, pull his leg free, and really lower, get his back almost parallel to the line, and then really begin to dig with that back and those and that big, strong upper thighs and, and buttocks. As 
the 34. Second and seven, they'll mark it as a three-yard game. We earned all three of them. Galliano. Siegel and he got crossed up that time as Siegel continued to run his pattern and Galliano felt perhaps he's made a read. Well, we hear so often about the fact that the quarterback and receivers have to be on the same page as they run their optional routes on the basis of how they read the defense. There, Galliano and Siegel certainly read it differently. Nick Corey, who has really just done an outstanding job of keeping this team going of late. This Portland club has played oh so well the last three weeks. Last time was the first down in which Portland has used a four-man line. They're in it again. Third down, seven. Galliano for Harrison complete. Leonard Harris that time was running in the opposite direction of the pass. And Denver again will be forced to butt. Dick Corey said he was going to mix his coverages in this game. The first six or seven snaps, he's in the basic 3-4, something very few teams have used against the run and shoot. I've seen only the Memphis uh, showboat use it. Then in the last two or three downs, they had six defensive back in the game. Just one linebacker, they went to a coverage-oriented approach. And you see Neil Hall awaiting the punt from Jim Asbury. Talk about a roller coaster ride. He had one last week, missing those early field goals from Chip Scott Rain in the rain, and then coming back to be the game zero. He'll go for the corner this time. Down to the nine yard line by Nate Harris. He simply was able to outrun the ball and down it inside the 10. Will return right after this. First and ten, Portland from their nine. Buford Short hammers his way out to the 17. That's the typical Jordan run. They're not sure whether this guy will be a better fullback than a running back. Well, we've heard Dick Corey say that, but here we see number 99, Calvin Turner, taking a hard upfield charge. Randy Vandiver turns him out and gets some help from Lewis Jackson, and then Buford Jordan does the rest on himself. Read the block well and really lowered his head, running light, as you said, a fullback. Calvin Turner out of West Virginia in his third year. They blocked well that time. Second down and three, Portland. No quick hit pattern. Johnson, and he's running the opposite way with it. He's in trouble and out of bounds way back at the 13. That was a very unusual hit pattern. I, because Robinson throws it backwards. That is a lateral. It was not a forward pass. I was looking <laughs> under the circumstances for Johnson to pass off of it. Keep your eye on him. He may do that later. Maybe he was supposed to, but was pressured so much by Lance Fields that he just took off and tried to make what he could out of the play. That's the Portland Breaker theory. Oh, run some flute makers at this time. John. I tell you, John Nevin came a long way to make that stop. He had to start to sprint to his left, number 59 in white, and that finally knocked him out of bounds. They give a lot of credit to their resurgence to Ron Johnson and Marion Brown. Reappearance in this Portland team. Inside handoff, and it goes to Dwight Beverly. Beverly gets it up to about the 19th. Not enough for the first down, and Portland, because of the loss, on that play, just a down and go, will be forced to fight. Johnson re-enters the game. You said that you really like the quality in this guy. He handles his score as fundamentally perfect as anybody in sports. This is a fundamentally exact punter. He punted for us in Kansas City, and then last year, he led the USFL with the Chicago Blitz. Lottie Harris is waiting at about his own 45. A lot of hang time, and fair catch is called for by Harris. But again, Denver will be operating with outstanding field position. They fail to scratch, as have the breakers. will return. <laughs> Denver and Portland are scoreless, and we're halfway through the first quarter. Tim Brando and Marv Levy with you. And again, Denver was a great place to start a drive at their own 47. Harris in motion. Galliano for Mark Lewis, and he simply dropped it. The pass may have been 
a bit low, but certainly catchable. Haynes was back there with Lewis, but again, he had every opportunity to come up with that one. Again, I think there was a little bit of a mix-up of the read that they had. Galliano expected a sharper post break from number 88, Mark Lewis, on the play. That's why he underthrew him, hit him sort of in the back of the lower leg with his throw. Galliano, 3 of 7 so far for 37 yards. They were a three-man line on first down on defense. And now they've got five defensive backs in the game and just three linebackers. Last down, they had four linebackers. Troy Johnson has entered the game now for Denver. Galliano will sit on it at midfield. He wanted to go to Johnson, but by the time Johnson became open, he was past the line of scrimmage and had to eat it. Well, with uh, five defensive backs in the game, they really overloaded the zone on the side to which Bob was sprinting. He had no one he could give it to. He saw a little free from the pass rush, decided to get what he could get out of it. There was a belief that the only way the running shoot could be totally effective was with a quarterback talented as Jim Kelly. But yet Bob Galliano has been so successful with it under Mouse Davis. And I think how well you read, and Bob does that well, is the key. Third down, seven, Denver at the field. Siegel again all alone and another drop back. Now Howard McAdoo, the linebacker, might have been a guy that gave Siegel footsteps, but look at this. Well, they're doubled up. Number 38, who's right in the middle of your screen in blue, was supposed to cover Siegel man-to-man. He's expecting Siegel to drive upfield. Siegel takes for a step or two up there and then broke across, and he really lost uh, uh, his coverage man on that play. I believe it was uh, Alex Watt. There's a miss on his last four passes, and again, they'll be forced to punt. Dino Hall awaits for the kick. How many times do you pass up opportunities like these if you're done that? Hall will let him go into the end zone in a wise decision. The Portland Breakers will be back on offense when we return to Civic Stadium in just a moment. We're scoreless. 7-0-1 left in the first quarter. The Breakers are loving the fact that they've been able to keep Denver off the scoreboard at this point. Right now, you know, Portland's had its difficulty offensively. They're still very much in this game with great play on the defensive side. First and 10 for Portland. Robinson nearly picked off, but Johnson has it for a first down. Hemphill and Miller were over. And they nearly had an opportunity for the pickoff. It was Miller that nearly had the interception. Denver was in his own defense, and he slid their strong safety into the flat. Number 25, Emily, almost gets in under it, and that would have been a touchdown. As you could see, nothing but turf in front of him, but it wasn't. It was a grab, and Johnson, they're out now in pretty good field position, and attributed a lot of that to a good state of a catch by Dino Hall, which kept him from downing the ball down around the five-yard line, giving him operating position. Johnson, at his fourth year out of Long Beach State, and the ball is marked at the 31. Buford Jordan, hemmed up, but yet finds a way. Weaving his way to the 40-yard line. Lance Shields made the stop. Jordan looking very good tonight. Here we see, this see old Shaw Sweet, nothing fancy about it. You just need a great tailback, but it's a fine cut by Jordan. Moving inside, lowering his head again, a la fullback style. Second down and one after the game of nine. Jordan, first down. Hemphill and Doug Nicholas, the left tackle of his stock. Jordan has had four 100 yard games, yet has been injured for more than half of the season. Good balance stance. Look how his shoulders square up to the line of scrimmage so that he can cut back behind his block and do the old, you know, it's a strike train, run to daylight. How they miss this guy and what a lift he's given them since he's come back. There you see, he also had 100 yards when they last met. As a matter of fact, one of Portland's best games from an offensive standpoint was earlier this year in a loss to Denver. A little reverse, but it got away. Rick lost it, found 
Hampton at about his own 18, and he's down at the 22. Harold Rich had clocked into the game. That's still Kenny that made the stop. The problems got underway when Rich couldn't come up with the ball. We also have a marker down. They get some tacked out of this, it really hurts. Still in the formation. On the offense, the penalty is declined. Second out. Then we see the pitch going here to Jordan, and what really happens is he puts the ball too high on the chest of Rick. He was steered there by Lewis Jackson, but he should have put it right at the belt line. He put it up there near the top of his numbers, and the result was he couldn't handle it. Fumble. Second down and 35. Robinson overthrows Dan Ross the side end. There's Ross who is easily beat Todd in the breaker offense. Don't go to him most often. Over all throws this time with Cincinnati of note. There you see Dick Corey's staff. But so much hinges on how well and how often they get the ball into Ross's hand. Well, Ross, he's a great control receiver, very sure-handed receiver. And the two key men are Jordan and now Dan Ross. When they function well, it's up there doing well. Goes down in an eternity. Yeah. 
Brooks is finally corralled at the 30-yard line. Joe Resnick, the first to get to him, along with Lindell Jones. There's Joe Resnick, whose father is a coach at Harvard, has been since 1970, and he also, his dad, Joe Sr., played for the Philadelphia Eagles in the 1950s. Then his blood out of Notre Dame. They were in a four-man line that time, as you specified, Kenny. Really get great double coverage on the wide receivers when that happens. There's a man who's single every time, but it's a different man, and they're challenging Denver to find him. You gotta look at Johnson's numbers. It's now third and six. Galliano in trouble again. Jeff Merrill. playing those defensive linemen in a variety of positions, too. They're not only going from a three to a four-man line, but they're moving them around with the offensive blockers. You can't get good recognition of who it is they have to pick up. They hope to confuse them some, they did that. That's it, gets it away. Dino Hall calls for the fair catch. But we have a marker down to hold everything. If it's against Denver, they'll decline. Let's hear it. Now go downfield on the kicking team, number 72. The penalty is declined. First down. Well, what I really should have said is they should decline. <laughs> and they did, because they have very good field position. That's they've had all night, really. Dick Coy, who's... Then received as if he were a native, going against the counterpart that says he is a native, although he actually was born in Washington, South Davis. He's been coaching in this area for so long before going into the pro ranks. There's Matt Robinson. Three completions, but it's the last one that counted. It's seven to nothing Portland with 251 left, first quarter. Thornton has stopped for no gain, and it was Thornton that broke through first. They put four receivers in there, but ran a trap play. They tried to trap Ruth Thornton, number 60, Frank Robert. There's Thornton. Roberts, number 67, the left guard. Thornton lowers that inside shoulder, fights across it, and makes a fine defensive play. Second and nine. Robinson to Jackson, and he loses it. That one will be ruled a pass. Nate Miller was over there to help break it up. Both teams have been using that type of play, and neither of them have come up with anything successful with it. Now, that was a hit screen. They took one step downfield with Jackson, then he stepped back, and they tried to release their offensive lineman in front of him. Once that ball popped off his hand, Gordon was in some kind of trouble, but St. Miller nearly redeemed himself for being the victim of the touchdown pass a little earlier this quarter. Nolan Franz and Marion Brown are in the game, playing to one side on third and nine. 220 left, first quarter. Robinson to Johnson, and it's broken up nicely by Lance Shields. Shields is a player that has been picked on by teams of late. That time he was right there. He read it well. Johnson really did not run a good pattern there, Ron Johnson. He rounded off an out route, and you can convince somebody you're going deep, particularly if you have just succeeded in running a successful a deep route. He just rounded it off, didn't drive field deep, field close on him well. Josh has got all of this one. And it stops inside the pit. David Bale finally downed it, but what a punt by Jeff Gossett. He is a great punter. He's unselfish. He kicks high. He kicks quickly. Uh, he'll kick the, the, the play punt. Here we see Gossett. He's a two-step kicker. Gets the ball away very quickly. Right in his hands. Great concentration. Perfect drop. He has it every time. A great follow-through. Hits the ball so that it drops and dies. He's in the opponent's territory, and that can set up a score for you. He got no help on the, on the bounce. He landed at about the six-yard line and then headed up the field. And then there's a guy named Frank Gant, who coaches the second team now the Eagles, who made Gossett what he was today. Great second team to go. First and 10, Denver, and it's 12. Eagles knocked 
pitch out of bounds by Rustic at the 18. This is one of the few times that Denver has started deep in its territory. They had the field position advantage early in the first quarter. But Galliano and company could do nothing with it. They're forcing the throw short a great deal. Whenever they bring Siegel or the other, or Leonard Harrison motion, they usually print out the bad side. Not always. that his team needs to win every game remaining to have a host position in the playoffs. Troy Johnson at the 35 for the first down. Lindell Jones and Marcus Merrick made the stop. You know, Tim, you hear about the fact that they use four wide receivers all the time. They run a two team. That time, that they used five wide receivers. They had no fullback in there. Now, Billy Johnson was in the game, but he lined up as an additional slot on one side. There was nobody behind Bob Galliano. First and 10 now for Denver. It's a 35. Remember, this drive got underway at the 12 after a beautiful punt by Johnson. forward wall, it appeared to be the tackle, Mike Miller. Ball start, number 61 on the offense, still first down. I beg your pardon, Greg Loberg. The opposite tackle. The guilty party. Words of wisdom coming from upstairs into the ear of Dick Corey. Constantly has that headphone propped against his ear, game by game. You know, he and I work together some. As he, he likes broadcasting, this guy, Dick Corey. While they were in Louisiana, in New Orleans. First down at 15. Siegel up to about the 31, but Joe Resnick stopped him in his track. a great read by Joe River. They brought Siegel in motion as you see him coming here to this side. Siegel, the other slap at the wide receiver, all start driving deep. They want the secondary to go deep, but he hooks up. And you see how long it takes the ball to come to him? Galliano waited too long to read that. The result was rest to close in. Robert Pennywell, number 52, also closed in, held it to a very short game. Second like down at 13. Joe Siegel, every time we see him, he has a big game. Usually the opposition that catches Denver wants to make them go the long way. And when that happens, Siegel is the recipient of a number of passes. Last play of the quarter coming up. There's Johnson on the delay. Running over breakers. One by one, they fall. He may have the first down to the 45. run by Johnson. He bounced off of so many tacklers. Here we see a full field view. The given to Johnson comes through the hole and everybody had to go through that hole. The big up and knocks off number 45. Number 28, goodbye. Number 40, yelling for help. Finally takes a bunch of guys to bring him down. They were like dominoes. They just kept falling, didn't they? Right now, though, it's Portland on top by seven at the end of one quarter. <laughs> Maybe Breakers fans, but they love Miles Davis, the homespun star, now the coach of Denver, and the Heartbreakers showing what they know to the fans here in Portland. Bob Galliano has had some difficulty early on, but has hit on his last few passes and has the gold in a good spot at the 45. We open the second quarter. Johnson. Four yards on the pickup. Okay, let's make the stop. I, I tell you, Tim, you, you say you want to play no tackle. Look at number 60. Two men on him. Tom Davis, George Yarno. He fights them both off. Comes back with the help of Alan Hughes to make the tackle. Alan Hughes, number 98, in the make the tackle. He's an interesting guy, Alan Hughes. Bodyguard for boxer Tommy Hearns. His father played with the Harlem Globetrotters. He also said that he liked the offseason music, yard work, and travel. I like music. And if I had to do yard work, I'd rather travel. <laughs> uh, you have about two acres, too, don't you? No running back now for Galliano. We're almost running 
a clear out that time for Leonard Harris. They were able to get about six to seven on the pass pattern. Joe Resting made the stop. Statistically in the first half, all those passing yards coming on the touchdown pass, of course, to Johnson for the most part, but it's the defense by Portland is going to be. Portland played very good defense, even though Denver's had a lot of time to control the ball. Portland has kept them very well contained in the Mount Danger territory. They've had so many opportunities in positions just like this. Starting drives around this field. Now remember, of course, they were on their patio when this, this particular drive got underway. Third down and three, Denver. The flip is on, and Gallagher's down. Alan Hughes. And got the job done, Alan Hughes. He sure did, but he got some help because the outside linebacker attacked Johnson here. We see a big attack by Ben Needham and then Hughes coming up from the inside to make the stop. Isaiah West was the linebacker that was blitzing that time, which really opened the door for trouble. Isaiah West it was rather than Ben Needham. As Luke will be forced to punt. Catch. Nate Harris, though, made the gutsy hit and enjoyed this interlude much more. You know, early in the game, Harris pulled off for fear of interfering. He timed this one a lot better. That was an all advice play by a fine, experienced safety man. 12.57 is left in the second quarter. Bob Galliano and crew must come back. They trail by seven. Here with 12.45 left at Civic Stadium in Portland. The Breakers lead by seven. We're in the second quarter. Play action. Brands incomplete. And he got sandwiched right between Nevin and Miller. They tried to work on Nate Miller again, drive him deep, and then hook up in front of him. But watch this middle linebacker, John Nevin. He reads the play fake. He knows he's really studied his uh, tendency sheet. Comes right back. Now he does hit above the shoulder pads, and that's illegal. Yeah, but the guy he hit was his own player. Yeah. Miller has really got the front of the hit. <laughs> that's illegal, too. <laughs> Second down is dead Portland. Broken field running by Portland tonight. Lewis Jackson finally nailed by Doug Nicholas and John Nevin. Here's Nevin. You know, you do a lot of change of direction drill with your linebacker. The toss starts to his all right. Look at him spin off the block as he reacts back. Fights his way through some other players and helps get in out of the tackle. They're an active linebacker. Very active. Third down and three coming up after Lewis Jackson did a seven-yard ad-lib. Out of the shotgun, Portland batting 25% tonight in these situations. And they give us to Jackson a nice call by Dick Boy for the first down. Now that surprised Denver's defense just a bit. It's surprising, but they also said in studying Denver and pass rush through short number six. He's going to come way upfield to wreck the passer. Let's turn him out and run a draw inside of him in a passing situation. He's third and three is. That was a draw play out of the shotgun. Mike McKibben made the hit. Lewis Jackson out of Cal Poly, who played with the Invaders last year. Good job. The reserve roll is pullback for Portland this year. About three, maybe four. It was uh, Bill Kenny that made the stop. Tom Bill Kenny. There he is. They are very active linebackers, Denver. Bill Kenny uh, did not play a lot the early part of the season. He's been playing more and more later and making a lot of tackles. They like him particularly on running downs. They think your first attempt is a little bit more of a running down. And others, they want to give Kevin a bit of a rest. So Bill Kenny's in there at the middle linebacker. Back it down. It's six for Portland at the 39. Bail in motion. 
Jackson. About two, maybe three. They will still need about four yards for a first down. Terry Irvin, a backup linebacker, into the game along with Doug Nicholas, makes a stop. You know, third and three, which is coming up here, Tim, is the toughest down for the coordinators. The offensive coordinator is really hard to figure out what he should call, and the defensive coordinator is a tough call. It's a tough call for both of them. It's always looking at what his uh, offensive coordinator has to say there. He makes it with a nice call. If he doesn't make it, he won't. Don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> in this formation, Bale and Mosha, and they give to Jackson again, and he's awfully close. Maybe about a half yard or so away from the first down, Steve Trimble, the free safety, came up to make the hit. You know, Trimble denied him the first down, and here is a very unheralded player. He's the number one tackler on their team, making a lot of tackles all season long. He's forcing into a tough situation here. Out of foot to go. Now, I think Dick Corey wants him to... Maybe take a time out, come over and talk about it, or just go for it, one or the other. No move as yet to bring Dawson into the game. Now, this would be a controversial decision with a punter like Dawson, who's already nailed the team inside the 10-yard line. You give your defense a chance to stop them and still come away with a field position. So that's, that's a Mississippi Riverboat gamble for Dick Corey, should he go for it. It's a tough call. And we'll see that call in just a moment. Right now, it's Portland leading by seven and stops it away. <laughs> Dick Corey in his third year, the USFL coach of the year in 83, had to the line with that last decision. He did choose to bring in Johnson after all. He called the timeout. That was wise. He's got one coach on his ear, go for another one saying, punt it. Called timeout, fought it over. I think he made the wise decision. He had too much to lose if he failed to make it here. And the fans would like to go for it, and but you got to make it. Yeah. And with a punter like Johnson, you got to believe that this really is the wiser decision. Again, another beauty by Johnson, and Harris calls for a fair catch, and look at that. They're down at the 13-yard line, and if your defense does this job, once again, you should get the ball, and Dick Corey knows it. Hey, I did the right thing, guys. Well, I, I think he did. Again, uh, there's no way of knowing if he went for it, would he have made it, or would he not have made it? You don't know. The tennis play, he's in front. He has the momentum in the game now. They would retain it. You retain it with a good punt, but you can sure lose it if you fail to pick it up in your own territory. you got to believe that Denver, who really had the field position advantage the first nine or ten minutes, must be saying to itself now, gee whiz, here we are again. We started our last drive at the 12, and this time we're at the 13. Galliano has connected seven times, but they've all been short games. Harris. Knocked away by Haynes. Tommy Haynes, the rookie from Southern Cal. That was a nice read by Tommy Haynes. He had dropped back into the middle. He read the ball from being thrown and closed well. Sam poke that left hand in there and knock it out. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't good fortune. You drill that. You teach your DD, your defensive back, how to strip the ball from a receiver when it's exposed before he can pull it in. Second down and 10, 8.20 left in the second quarter. Jim Brando and Marv Levy with you on ESPN. We're happy you joined us. Denver trailing Portland 7 to nothing. The always active linebacker, Robert Pennywell and Marcus Merrick were there to polish up. It was a deep zone coverage. Willie Jarrett has a blocking assignment this way. He's after shooting. See him look around. Who can I help? Who can I help? Now he sees Stallianos in trouble. He's yelling, hey, Bob, Bob, remember me. And he dumps it off and then he's able to keep him having a bad play. Third down is five. That you told me once before about a remind me coach. <laughs> that was a remind me fullback. He would have got really stuck in the back when he cried. What are you throwing the beef for? <laughs> Johnson again, the lone set by. Eagle goes in motion to the top of your screen. One pump fake and a completion for a first down. The mark 
Lewis and Robert Pennywell made the stop. The inside linebacker on the left side. Lewis went through about three or four games where he didn't catch any passes. And last week he was the key receiver for Galliano. About nine balls last week. Why does that happen? I'll tell you why. Well, Davis will tell you why better, of course. Because we don't take what they give us. There was a game where they were giving him Siegel, taking Lewis away. He was going 15 or 16 times. Last week they were worried about Siegel and, and Leonard Harris. Lewis was the man being singled. He went through him. That's the way they read it. Good crowd on hand at Civic Stadium. Behind the team that's had in trouble. But it played well of late. First down and 10 now. Troy Johnson in and out of his hands. And again, it was Haynes that made the hit. Haynes was moved to free safety in this game. There is such a thing as, as, as free. He's the man deep in the middle of the left ear string. He's just dropping back. Let no one get deeper than you. Read the quarterback. The ball's all now closed. Come with all you got, and he's doing a good job of it. Good move. They move. They entertain Tommy Haynes and Joe Resnick for this game. On Joe's tonight game, Resnick is in the free safety. Haynes was strong. Haynes likens himself to Jack Tatum because he's patterned himself after him. We've already seen that evidence the last couple of times. He's made hits and has caused the ball to pop free. Second and ten. Johnson. Now one of the helmets for Sean, belonging to Wilberg, the guard. While the helmet was rolling, so was Johnson up to about the 33. McAdoo, Howard McAdoo, the linebacker, made the stop out of Michigan State. I know the pullback in this offense really gets some gaping holes. The reason is, some linebackers are so fast defense passes. They drop off, and there are a few gaps in between the line men who are left. It's a, it's a pullback key light if you have a good enough passing game, and they sure do. Well, Johnson deserves a lot of credit for the yards he picked up, but he does get to build up some speed before he gets cut, doesn't he? Absolutely, and he's the perfect runner for that. This offense helps really negate the hard-hitting line inside linebacker. Third down and six. Johnson to Lewis. Mark Lewis. And another first down at the 43-yard line. As Galliano thread of the needle. Lewis running a deep post pattern. You see Joe Resnick, who had deep middle coverage on that, according to their coverage stall, getting there a little bit uh, late on that, that he should have been there earlier. Bruce Miller had to protect the outside. They hit the crease very well out of for a good long game. Did a nice, nice mark. They mixed their plays well. Joe Resnick, who really is the anchor to Portland's defensive backfield. He's so much for this team. How they defense anyone, especially the running shoot. Inside the 20 to the 18. And so goes the run and shoot. Sooner or later you'll find the scene. Lewis appears to be a bit shaken up. Here's the identical play. Galliano throwing the right on timing. His dip, dip, bang, delivered. The Mark Lewis running the post pattern. And you can look for Portland to change up what coverage they use. Particularly in this part of the field. Inside the 20, you go a bit more man to man. I don't know if you will against the run and shoot. Before another six or seven are picked up. And they did split. They were bringing a lot of linebackers, reading in the damn coverage. Johnson found the crease. The late flip, he couldn't pre read it. Johnson just full speed ahead, find that crease. Ben Needham hit him first, but he needs help on the play. There's Bill Johnson. He has been ailing, of course, has been in and out of the lineup and parts of games, depending on his physical well-being. They want him healthy for the playoffs. Stuck it down at three. Galliano stuck by Bayless again. Now this is a team with only 22 or 23 sacks on the year. Low in the league. They already 
only have three in this game tonight, and we're still three minutes left in the second quarter. Well, Davis told us today the man he feared on this team was Gerald Bayless. There we see Bayless coming up the middle. We see there were two white shirts who were trying to double team on him and work his way around. Comes up with a big pack because it's third, about 12 to go. And the ball back now is the 20 yard line. He was about to run out of terrain, Bob Galliano, but found his man before he was forced out of bounds. He was really looking for Leonard Harris short. You see his change his eyes at the last minute. Mark Lewis did a nice job after running his pattern. That wasn't his real pattern of coming back at Galliano when he saw that the basic timing of the play had broken down. He's already four catches for 74 yards tonight. Three of them, at least on this drive, that I can recall. Two of them are third and long. At the five-yard line, Galliano has the first and goal. I think Portland may have had 12 men on the field. No, they didn't. They had 10. <laughs> That's what it, they called the timeout. You knew something was amiss in terms of number of men, but they were short of men. And they got a lot of collapse. Portland, their second timeout. At any rate, a wise choice given the circumstances. And the coaching staff did get word to the team to call for the timeout. They have it. Their lead is by seven. It's in a bit of jeopardy, and we'll return right after this. Here is first down and goal for the goal. A trail seven to nothing. Dime back who had come into the game will give the official call. Pass interference on the defense, number 32. That's an automatic first down. Diano took a quick look at his left wide receiver, Lonnie Turner, who was single and very obviously so, but felt he didn't want to go to him when he looked back. Leonard Harris was wide open. Taylor knew it was a touchdown. He just grabbed his ankle and it was a pass interference call. So probably not a bad idea, though, when you know you're beaten and all they can get is half the distance to the goal. At least you've eliminated uh, the touchdown. Yes. If the official had determined it was purposeful, well, he has to be sure that it was. And if certain the end zone, he could have placed the ball on the one yard line. He thought it was definitely purposeful. Either way, the ball is on the two and it's still first down. Johnson up with a lot of scrimmage, but still furrowed his way to the one, carrying breakers with it. You know, Frank Wilson came unblocked from the outside. I don't know if somebody missed the block on him or if that's the way the play was designed as a wish block. Timeout has been called for by Denver. They trail by seven, but they're on the one. <laughs> Brando and Marv Levy back with you, the Portland Breakers. Up seven to nothing on Denver. 79-yard touchdown pass coming from Matt Robinson to Ron Johnson. But right now, Denver, after beginning its drive at the 13, has made its way to the one-yard line of Portland. Third, second down and goal. You know, Denver's had 10 rushing touchdowns, 9 rushing touchdowns out of their quarterback so far this season. Yeah, but there's the big bull right behind Galliano. Johnson. And he gets it, and he has a touchdown. You know, they put another running back in a slot on that number 33. Donnie Williams hardly plays, comes across there, and he gets one whale of a block on the corner. You see the defender trying to get up there, paving the way for Billy Johnson to get into the end zone. There's the pitch. Great old wide pitch play. Donnie Williams, number 33, getting a very key block on Dwight Taylor. Giving him a chance to tie it up right now. with 
the extra point. And we're tied at seven. 155 left first half. And we'll return to Civic Stadium after this. Pacific Northwest, where Denver and Portland are tied at seven. After a long, long drive by the goal to finally tie this game. Up to about the 25-yard line is Rick. There you see the scoring drive, 12 plays, 87 yards, a long drive for the Denver Gold. Bill Johnson, the touchdown run, and Denver hit it the hard way, Marvin. They had so many opportunities in the first quarter with great field position and couldn't take advantage. Well, they were reading the coverages better on this drive, particularly the Galliano to Mark Lewis connection. Three big receptions on that drive. First down at 10 for Matt Robinson. Three of nine, but one of those three was a bomb that gave the breakers the early lead. Buford short. Still, Kenny made the stop at the 30 yard line. Aided a bit by Pat Over in the midst of tackle out of Wyoming. Buford George has played collegiately at Maine State. He is the most prolific runner in the history of Louisiana collegiate football. John Devonstein works out of the sidelines. Still, Kenny's been in there. He came up with a big, big hit on Buford Jordan last down, but nothing to miss with the John Devin. Stuck it out at six for Portland. Robinson to Dan Ross. First down, Portland. Irvin and Phil Kenny on the stop. They're working under a little pressure now because they only have one timeout remaining to them this half. But again, the clock stops over the teams and moves up first down. Beverly is in the game now. I've won good back, and Robinson just threw that one away. In the general direction of you for Jordan. He, he threw it over Jordan. No intention even trying to complete it there and risk the interception. He came out looking for Dan Ross again. Darrell hits on number 25 to strong safety did a good job of covering it. Nolan Franz breaking in the play from the breaker sideline. Al Davis, unusually with a headset off, awaiting half time. Lewis Jackson now is one set back. Out of the shotgun. The premature movement by Denver. The flag guard down and Robinson has the gimme and finds Marion Brown. How many times do you see that? The premature movement in the forward wall, and Robinson knew he had a gimme. If his offensive line had not drawn Denver offside, we'll just wait and see. Still in the motion on the left guard on the offense. Yep. Still second down. Well, Robinson thought he had a cheap one, and he came up with a big play, but now Davis breathes the sigh of relief. Well, he. Really, you see that happening. As you say, he probably thought it was the other team that had jumped offside, that Denver had jumped offside. So you're loose. You take all kinds of chances. Yeah. It's lit. Great. Oh, but had he known that it was this guy that would still be a motion. Suck it down at 15. Hubert Jordan is back in the game. Robinson for Ryan Johnson again. Lance Shields was back there, man to man with Johnson, and did a good job. Wasn't a very well thrown ball. The two potential off and defensive players both had to pull up, and it became a jumping contest. Ball was well under thrown, and sort of had a tail on it, fluttered out there. Robinson has been a much maligned quarterback since his trade in the National Football League, and he cost Denver so much money, you might recall. Well, he. He started out very poorly here, but in the last three games, not counting this one, he completed 60% with almost 10 yards per attempt, which is very good. On third down, Johnson! He got it! First down at the 39. Delaney will argue the point, but only briefly. And with 40 
Lakers are second. Well, the Lakers are in business again. With that much time left and three timeouts, they ought to call for the red flag. With that much time left, because I'm not sure he got that second foot down. Thompson looking around. He'll deliver the ball out here. Let's take a look. Does Ron Johnson get it down? There comes the... Yes, he does. He did get it down very neatly, very precisely. Now Ron Johnson, who already is the offensive hero of the game, running that fly pattern for 79 yards. And now I get the feeling that a red flag has been asked for, and yeah, we have it. It is a nothing to lose deal, but his coach in the press box probably says, thought like I did, had his doubts. He's got three timeouts left, 46 seconds. Take a look. Another look, and you'll see that he did just a bit. I think his right foot is on the ground almost simultaneously with the catch, and then he brings the left one down. All right, let's see. Catch right foot down, drag the left foot right in the bounds. Mitchell looking at it closely, hit the catch. Officials tonight for this game. Don Wilson, the referee, Arthur McCullough, the umpire, the headlines of Stuart Ross, Steve Moore out to line judge, Bill Freddy is the back. Right a timeout is called together. Yep. Now, we could have told you up here. Well, I can see it better here than all you guys, including those fellows in the striped shirt. Well, you talk about a fun wow. guy to be around. Now, Davis, is, as well as his counterpart tonight, Big Corey. Two guys that are just a joy. They are very cooperative, and they certainly know the game well. They're watching quite a battle here tonight. 7-7 seven to seven our score with 46 seconds left in the second quarter. Breakers scored first, but Denver answered here in the second quarter. Robinson. First sack of the game recorded by Denver. Mark Rubin did the damage. Quite a bit of stunning in that defensive line. Finally brings Rubin free. Everybody was coming to see Robinson double pump. Hey, I better get out of here. Look at that big guy. Number 65 coming. It's a little bit too late. Break it down in corner. Marion Brown. Yes, it's the 38. Darrell Hemphill made the stop for Denver. Clock is still ticking. They did not get the first down because of the loss. It's now third and nine. To use their final timeout, perhaps. Wasted a few seconds doing it. Hope they can get a playoff and still reserve the timeout. They have some others, but. No, no, no go. 17 seconds are left as we look at Big Corey talking with his coach, Matt Robinson. Now, coming up at halftime, Tom Meese will bring you up to date on the week in the United States Football League. As you see the timeouts remaining, Portland without it. And during halftime, a, a fine feature on Herschel Walker, who, of course, broke the all-time single-season rushing record last week. And let me tell you, I had the opportunity to be there for it, and it was quite an event. Well, I thought, I heard your golden voice <laughs> drive it, uh, Tim, and uh, it was. It was quite a thrill, and he got it in grand style with that long touchdown run. 55-yard touchdown run, and a lot of people, of course, say there's an asterisk by it. And Herschel's the first to tell you that's true. Yeah, 2,000 yards is 2,000 yards, isn't it, Coach? I've never, I haven't seen any better back in this league or any other one. That is a tall statement. <laughs> Shields. The ball is a little bit behind France, allowing Shields to make the stop. They're calling an offside on defense. Off 
inside. Number 60 on the defense. Still third down. Well, you mentioned five yards. It wouldn't hurt if they got that cheaply. They got that now. Now, here's, here's the thing. They can go for a first down. It'll stop the block or they can call a timeout. Try and get closer. But the one thing he is saying on, on that sideline is the coach. Don't get back. Don't get back. Throw it away if it like you're going to. So Bruce Thornton got caught. It's now third and four. But significantly, just 12 seconds left. And no timeouts remaining for Portland. Well, some of the fans are booing, but that, that was one of those things. If it was there, try and hit him. If he isn't there, throw it away. As I said, don't get sacked. So, Robinson did the right thing. Johnson had broken three, and had he had about oh, three or four yards in the head start, might have come up with a reception. Tim Mazzetti comes in. He'll kick it from his 40. That will make it a 50-yard kick. And interestingly, Mazzetti will never look up to see the end result of a long kick. We'll see what the result is here. Nolan France will hold. came into his, into his vision picture. See him here. It heads down when he meets the ball very well. To really fire. Here comes that. Here comes the uh, rush of Bill Siegel on the outside. He the heck with what I said. I'm looking up. <laughs> Look how happy he's looking up all right. Things are looking up for the Portland Rangers there. 10 to 7, our score. That's Mike Berry, who not only coaches the offensive line, but the special teams as well. There's a very conscientious job with those teams. Mazzetti's had a full throw in his father this year. He's got a number of kids blocked. And that's been one of the, the problems with special teams for the Breakers. The teams that have losing records usually have an occur from time to time. Well, last week he had some tough going because he had a field goal block and a PAT block. And Mazzetti, who also spent some time as a broadcaster while in Boston while the Breakers were there, and also a sportscaster in Atlanta, says he's considering that again with a 14-month layoff that's coming up. Well, he's got he some instructions from the sidelines. He's telling all these guys what to do. I'm going to bounce the kick. Don't cover it too fast. Some of you guys stay back, or you stay back, and they say scoop it up. And have more instructions here than they could remember in a full season to give in a situation like this. So we've got an interesting first half, haven't we? Very much so. Anybody's game, Denver offense certainly came to life last time they had ball possession. Six 
maybe seven yards. John Nevin made the stop. David Dale's in motion. This is a great shot. It's Jackson. They get a double team block on the nose tackle. And Broderick Thompson comes off. He doubled the nose. With the nose is under control, he slid off and picked up the linebacker. A fine block by the young man. Lewis Jackson, played on the Division II National Championship team at Cal Poly. Jackson again. Same play. All the way to the 40. Right now, they've lined up with a single back in the backfield. Passing luck. Here we see again running up over Thompson and all of and uh, Roger Lavasa, the center, paved the way. And then Steve Tribble, the leading tackler, has to bring him down, but not until after a sizable zoom. Denver had great field position as a result of that penalty on the nine yard line, but now it's Portland which has the favorable field position. Both teams went backed up and done the job. Hubert Jordan has re entered the Portland offense. Play big. Jackson, the culprit, and it's another first down for the Breakers. Well, I'll tell you, Terry Irvin is in at that outside linebacker where Stan Blinken normally plays. They think they're on. Look at Jordan. Right? They think they have that ties up number 50, 60 outside backer who has man-to-man -man coverage on the other back. Lewis Jackson, number 25, before he realizes I've got to cover him, Jackson is by him and he's got a good game. So Dick Corey using Jackson effectively, who had really given Al Davis some problems in college. He gained 223 yards rushing while at Cal Poly against the Portland State team of Davis. Jordan, go about the 29. They have decided, for whatever reason, I don't know, they're going to run inside. I guess the reason is it's a cheating. That's a darn good one. <laughs> and they keep repeating them. But they are really blowing them out in the middle right now against the two best tacklers in the front four. That's uh, Pat Odron and uh, Doug Nicholas. To develop Jordan's story a bit further, remember, being the most prolific runner in Louisiana collegiate history means he bypassed the likes of Charles Alexander at LSU. Another surge off the offensive forward wall on a second and five. Gets about three for Buford Jordan. Joe yeah. Kenny with the hit. They're turning off well the right side. Thompson gets straightened up there, but Dan Hurley, number 62, with help from, from uh, Lewis Jackson. Turn out Bruce Thornton. They run up inside of him and fight off another good chunk of yardage surge and two. Both John Nevin and Stan Blinka are not in action, so Denver's linebacking core is hurt, and this may be the reason why they're going so hard to the running game and to the play-action game where linebackers have to cover. Now, interestingly, Miles Davis lost Nevis, you might recall, on the opening kickoff two weeks ago against the Los Angeles Express. He also was ailed a bit against the Houston Gamblers, and now losing Blinka also for some time. He's got to hurt because Blinka is a guy with NFL experience, the season veteran out of Sam Houston. There's Dick Corey talking it over with Kevin Starkey and company as you look at John Nevins, who's now a spectator. And Portland leads by three. And Portland's moving the ball on the ground and leading 10-7. We're just underway third quarter. 11 minutes and 49 seconds left. Jim Brando and Marv Levy with you. We're happy you joined us on ESPN. Number 25, Craig Walls brings him down. Daryl Hempel turns him back inside. Kept him from going a long way, but at least uh, they picked up the first down. Craig Walls has a gleam in his eye at practice as Mouse Davis. Marches to the beat of a singular drum, but gets the job done. He's out of the game now. It's first and 10 at the 23-yard line. has it at the 17-yard line. Gain of six, it will be second and four. Lance Shields made the stop. That was 
was a pattern where Nolan France started to drive upfield. There was another receiver lined up on the same side to his side. He did go upfield, and France broke in under him against man-to-man -man coverage. He was completed for a sizable gain, about seven or eight yards. France had his best year in 83 when the franchise was in Boston. Made a number of big plays in that 11 and 7 Cinderella season that Dick Corey enjoyed. for the breakers and another first down. Still Kenny made the stop. They're using Dale lining him up as a wide receiver, sending him in motion and then running behind him. Less than 10 minutes left in the third quarter. And Portland, remember now, they began their drive deep in their own territory after a penalty on the opening kick. is a pass and said they've been running. They pitch the ball to Jackson. Craig Wall is a very mobile linebacker. Again, you see him number 55 coming into your pitcher, pursuing down the line of scrimmage and wrestling him out of bounds. Darrell Hemphill is the injured defender. Darrell Hemphill, his third year out of West Texas State. They're taking a look at him there. The Portland Breakers are on the move. Using the momentum they gained at the end of the second quarter after a few goal by Mazzetti. For now, that's the difference. Portland leads Denver 10-7. There you see him, though. Put off on most of his own power, but they're going to take a longer look at him along the sideline. Looks like he's signifying his groin is bothering him. Robinson has not missed on a pass here in the third quarter on this drive. He's back to pass again. Jackson, the intended receiver, but Robinson threw in the middle of a number of defenders. Ernie Carswell was back along with the linebacker, Walls. Carswell had to come into the game for Hempel while he took that breather, so they went right to work on him. Carswell did a good job of covering. So now it's third and ten coming up. Dick Corey and staff have brought in something from the sidelines of the Opal Works. Remember Jackson, who's the lone cutback, has been the central figure in this drive for Portland up to this point. There he is again. And he's going to throw it. For Bale, intercepted. He hesitated prior to getting rid of it. And it's picked off by Lance Field. Well, the idea was good, but the results were Sales is in running in motion and blocking a lot. He runs in there. Jackson shows the pass through. So the work he determined he wasn't going to throw it. He might as well forgot that Fields was not fooled. He hung back there. He had the back of the end zone to help him. Easy pickoff of that long, long drive. Results were nothing for them except some pretty good field position. After having been the central figure in the drive, he is also the key figure in the play that ended it. First down arc turnover of the night. So at the 40 yard line, Denver takes over. They used up nearly six minutes on that drive, the breakers. Galliano. Found a little room, not out to about the 24 yard line. Second down and six coming up. Alan Curry running it out of bounds. So he had a wanted to hit Mark Lewis on an out cut there, but as, as uh, Lewis broke out, he was tightly covered on the play by Bruce Miller in the left corner. Galliano had to pull it down from that point on. It was every man for himself. Galliano had a tough outing. Although he did pick up 435 yards, he had three passes intercepted inside the 20. Now Davis told us that he thought it was his fault. Well, he felt some of the calls. He wish he could take a bet. The best play 
tell you, I don't that whole game with his field goal hold on the last play of the half. He tried out, put it down, they won the game. In range, second and six, Johnson gets two. You'll see the most prolific runners this year in the United States Football League, Herschel Walker. And tonight, of course, we're seeing the third leading rusher in this league, Bill Johnson. And we'll have consistent reports through that New Jersey-Oakland game on Jacksonville and Memphis, which includes Mike Rozier, of course. It was Roger Lavasa, the injured player, not Dan Hurley, the center. And this puts the breakers off this in a perplexing situation. They'll move Frank Roberts. Frank Roberts from guard to center. And will insert either Cotolo, John Cotolo, or Bill Winters at the other guard spot. They only have two backup offensive linemen. It is Winters 
and moves to guard while Roberts is the center now on second and three. Touchdown, Denver. Greg Walls made the hit. And then off to the races with hip hell for six. And if you're looking for turning points, remember this play. Here we go. It's the pitch. The Jordan, the play. They've run several times. Hey, about way out there, see? And Walls knocks it out. Hip hell picked up right along the side. Look at the defensive coordinator, Joe Herring. Go, go! He yelled the instructions. Come on, Drew, you gotta work on your fist. <laughs> he hurdle that guy. That's one of the great runs of all time by Joe Herring along that sideline. <laughs> I tell you, his hair was flying. He hurdle, fist yelling. That was great. Move over Edwin Moser. <laughs> and Joe Herring, who was with Pittsburgh last year, moved over to Mal Davis's half this past year. Happy about that play. He's going to be the first guy in the training room tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> As was with the extra point, and just like that, it's 14-10 Denver in their quest for the West, and we'll return right after this. After all that excitement, we'll see if anyone else can live up to the filling on either sideline. <laughs> Short man picking it up for Portland, Alex Clark. Nate Harris made the stop. No, a little while ago, Tim, I was making sure there's been no turnovers in this game, but all of a sudden Jackson throws in an interception. We get the fumble that Needham comes up with, and Hempel picks that one up for a touchdown. One great thing, it is unpredictable. And Robinson now who connected on a bomb on a third and 35. Now, how unusual would that be for Portland to hit on third and 35, a touchdown pass 79 yards? Very, very. So you see a plane drop off the goal. That's the 28. Robinson on first down. Ryan Johnson has it. First down at midfield. Trimble made the stop. And this game is beginning to take shape as one that... It's going to be entertaining throughout. You know, what you beat a man deep? He steers you the rest of the day. They take the hand off to Drew Jordan, but Jackson has driven the defender very deep on the play. Nate Miller hooked up in front of him. They have lots of room to make the grab for a good chunk of yardage, and they're back in business now trying to recapture the lead. 14 to 10. Ron Johnson already with five catches in the game. Denver on top with their first lead of the game. Quick hit out here to Jackson. Another first down for Lewis Jackson. They haven't scored any points in this quarter, but they've moved the ball steadily downfield against the Denver defense, and Jackson is a good part of that. They moved it very well. Turnovers, of course. They hurt them twice when it had the ball in very good scoring position. He's been utilized as a pass receiver as well as Roger Jackson. We have an official timeout now. We have an injured linesman or line marker, one or the other. Don't put that on injured reserve, right? <laughs> Bring in a new one, guys. Oh, yeah, bro. Okay. Injured Kane. Bounces over the other guy. Stretch that chain all the way. Can I get the full thing? Yeah, you stretch it, all right. Wonder what it costs to put the chain on the developmental squad. 14 to 10 is our score. The Denver Gold on top, making good use of the opportunities of Portland. Something that I've been aware of is two of the top receiving threats of the game. Dan Ross on one team has been shut down fairly well, and Leonard Harris hasn't been real productive tonight after a 177 yard game just a week ago against the uh, Houston Gamblers. Here comes Evans back in and out now because uh, too late. Joe Kenny also going out, and Irvin also goes up. 
one linebacker in the game. They really spread out that secondary. First down, swing pattern for Jordan. He makes one great move. Fumbles again and fumbles it out of bounds. He gains seven yards on the fumble. Inside the 25 and the 23. Greg Walls made the hit again. The ball popped free, but a different result this time for Jordan. comes off the ball and shifts. I thought it might have been diverted to Jordan. He's awfully hard to bring down that open field. He's covering the ball with two hands, but it's just stripped by Craig Walls, who is a big play man for Denver and playing a bang-up game tonight. Jordan comes out of the game. Let him settle down. That's the thought. Portland owning time of possession, but as Marv Levy mentioned at halftime, sometimes that doesn't matter. That's been the case tonight. Inside the 20 to the 18, a gain of five. It will be second down and five for Portland. The right side of the Portland line, Roderick Thompson and uh, Dan Hurley have done a very good job tonight. They've tended to stress running that way, particularly on inside plays, since their left side is so banged up. Uh, they've got people. Lewis Bullard is out over there. Jerry Raymond is out. So, uh... They're, they're struggling on the left side. They're holding their own, but they're stretching what they should when they feel their stronger linemen are. By the way, Lavasa has come back into the game at center. Roberts has moved back to the guard, and Winters is now out of the game. Second and five. Johnson! Nearly a miraculous catch by Ron Johnson. Nate Miller coming off an injury was there to make the play. For different. Robinson flings that ball. It goes a little bit behind Johnson. Above his back shoulder, as you can see. And then coming in very tough to comb it out again. The old defensive strip drill uh, to pull it away, Nate Miller. Miller got burned early, but I've got to give the young man credit. He's fighting tooth and nail the rest of the way. He didn't let it get him down. He hasn't put his skin on his chest. He's a battler. He's against a tough, tough receiver out there. So right now, just taking a few lumps himself. That's Ron Johnson. They're sending to him, and... Matt Robinson over to discuss the issue. You see all the way out there, Dick Corey, to check out his player. He's a player's coach. And one of the first guys to get there to his injured player was the head coach of the team. Coming up this weekend, New Jersey against Oakland. Paul McGuire and I will be there for that one here on ESPN tomorrow. Jacksonville, Memphis. Now, we'll have continual updates on that final game in the Eastern Conference from Memphis. So, during that New Jersey Open game, we'll have that game covered for you as well. And then there's the rest of the schedule. Birmingham, Tampa Bay, a critical game for the Bandits. Arizona taking on Los Angeles. Arizona theoretically not out of it in the Western Conference. With some help, they could be in it with nine losses. San Antonio and Houston coming up on ESPN Monday night. Roger Swivel and Mike Hafner will bring you that game. And Houston is in a must-win situation. They're a team that's been sliding a bit of late. Houston and Tampa Bay have been struggling here in the in the stretch run. The both are very much in it. A, a win for either team plunges them right back into the into the heart of the Johnson keep walking off there. Uh, he seems okay, but he has to come out of the line. They sent in Geno Hall, their tallest wide receiver, came out. The shortest one just went in. Miles Davis, this is in many ways his hometown. He's up by four, third and five. A little bit of running juice from Portland here. because he had trouble with the springs on his shoulder pads. And by the time he looked up, he realized his man was running a pattern in the flat. Oh, my gosh, I better go get him. He finally gets over and pushes him out of bounds. It's too late. But how ironic. It's Portland, the home for Miles Davis, that comes out with a little run and shoot to pay tribute to the counterpart on the different sidelines. He goes for a vital first down. They were in a run and shoot formation. <laughs> Jackson out of bounds at the three. And we have another.
another injured breaker player. Lineman Broderick Thompson is down now. Bruce Jackson here taking the pitch. They run so much from single bat. David Bale was in both laying it around the corner. Great effort there by number 56 and number 59 to make the stop. Harry Irvin and John Nevins respectively on the play. Thompson's back up, ready to go. Well, you really have to lose your breath if you're big boy when you see those offensive linemen go down. They're running out of them. They just come into their power formation. Number 61, Bill Winters, lines up as a tight end. Winters with a tight end in college. But four touchdown passes in one game to Chris Jackson and Jordan, the setback. Second and two. Jackson. They have not ruled that he got in. You of the breakers gave a thumbs up signal, but no one else. It will be third and goal from the one. Irvin, Hemphill, still kidding. Thornton, among others, there to stop him. It's a pit play designed to go wide. Due to Jordan leading it around the outside. Jackson pushing through daylight and he really pit fail for the goal line. There is a great stop. I wish I could identify the player that did it there. I can't see his jersey number. It's a great stop to deny him an inch or two shy of the goal line. than a yard for Portland. Robinson, touchdown! got the spike, but it's Robinson that scores. He breaks the plane, touchdown now. Everything else that happens is meaningless. Broke that plane. And again, you just have to reach the white line. You don't have to cross it. The white line is in the end zone. Tim Mazzetti comes on. Nolan Brands will hold. And Mazzetti says thank you to Nolan Franz there. And Matt Robinson got the job done again. Portland coming through in a drive that you really have to believe they had to have coming off of that bad break that gave up a touchdown. Absolutely, after two turnovers, which denied them touchdowns, one of them actually being a 14-point turnover, seven they didn't get, and seven which Denver did get. Had to give him a lift at the time when they needed it. There's three minutes and a few seconds left in the third quarter. I know you made your living at one time coaching special teams, but I've never seen anyone react so well to that special team aspect. And you could tell that Nolan France made a key hole there off a bad snap. Yes, he did. And people think of special teams, they usually think you mean the punter and the play kicker. It's so much more comprehensive than that, uh, Tim. Much more comprehensive. Take a look at the score drive, however, uh, nine plays, just three minutes and 17 seconds is all it took him to go 72 yards, big pass along the way, one to Ron Johnson, one to Lewis Jackson, which I think were the key plays in the drive. Then Mazzetti about to kick off. Harris, Caleb for a back deep, along with Nate Harris. Call blocks behind above the way. Still legal block above the way. Number 24 on the receiving team. Our first down. So it's pretty darn close. All the on Ernie Carr as well. Here we get a look at it. Here we see. 33 Rick closing in. Carswell definitely from behind above the way. 10 yard penalty. I mean, it usually hurts our nose. It not only is a 10 yard penalty, but very often negates a long kick return. Now, Denver's in a situation where they must make something happen. Absolutely. Deep in their own territory, a penalty right after a play like that really hurts. Galliano, 12 of 20 as you do it. That's what you have to do, right? Try to get the big. 
big play and markers are down and a big play will be the end result. Miller will be called for interference. I'd like to see that one again. <laughs> I thought Miller came in and made a fine play closing in. He did two. Number 40 on the defense. That's an automatic first down. There's where Dick Corey says, give me another red flag. Here he is. Let's take a look. Number 40 striding for the ball. Well, it's Hard to tell, really. It looks to me like he's driving to the ball. Hard to tell. Well, he can't ask for two and one half. I thought he was driving into the ball, driving the ball all the way. Dick Corey wanted another red flag, but you can't ask for a second one. But I thought it doesn't count. There's no thought. There's one of those things you call when you see. Neither team has been penalized a great deal, but... When they have, apparently it's come at an inopportune time. First and 10 at the 25. Once again, Jeff Mel got a hand on it and caused the incompleted pass. Leonard Harris, the intended receiver, but Mel got a hand on it. Eric, as he said, is in very quiet tonight. Bob Galliano has got to be asking himself at times exactly what can I do in this situation. They're, they're giving him stuff, but you get the feeling the Portland defense is bothering him a little bit. Marlon is doing a great job in defense. People are becoming more and more familiar with the offense. It gets harder to make it work as they do. Second down and ten. Hughes gave the pressure and it's picked off by Thor. Hughes and Gerald Bayless had a lot of pressure on me. So you don't have to hurry it. As a result, it was tipped. Thor picked it off. Let's get a look. We're going to see the entire secondary here. Spread out. They're driving into deep zones. All the rushes coming from up front. Trying to hit the short crossing route there to was it uh, Siegel or Johnson, but it is tipped. Door heads right up field. Diano trying to sprinkle his own right on this as he seeks to read the pattern. See Bayless ain't 60, even though he doesn't make the stop. He forces the play back inside where Hughes really lowers the boom on Galliano there. And this is Store again. First interception for Store of the year. Greg Store out of Boston College. Jackson. Nevins runs him out of bounds. What speed? Lateral pursuit by Nevins. Loss of a yard. That's one of those bounce outside plays that there's nothing inside. We see Jackson take him close up. I'm going to get outside. The defense has collapsed, but uh, John Nevins just slides down behind the line. Probably pinch charges up front, which leaves the middle linebacker the opportunity to roll from tackle to tackle. And Nevins is the right guy to do that type of assignment. Dug it down on 11 yards to go now for the breakers. Dan Ross in the game at one side end. Dale in the other side end. One side end look here. Robinson. Nowhere near the intended receiver, Dale. Ron Johnson, the wide receiver, to break back out on a flag pattern. The way he threw the ball, because so it was such a tremendous lead if he was going to bail, but uh, hard to believe that's who he was thinking he was going to Bail has come out, Brown has come back in. There's Bob Galliano. Back up quarterback in Kansas City for Marv Levy during his tenure there. He's found a home in the running shoot. From his deep middle spot, had to cover man to man against Lewis Jackson. Robinson laid it in there perfectly out of the shotgun formation. Just lost it. The minute he read it, he was getting the blitz. You saw Walls there blitzing 47. Steve Trimble had impossible coverage on it if Robinson could lay the ball in that well, and he did. 139 is left. 
And Lewis Jackson is quickly becoming tomorrow morning's sidebar story in the Oregonia newspaper here. He's been some factor. There he is again. That time stopped in a hurry by Doug Mickler himself, a Portland skater. Played for Miles Davis here. Only early, though. Actually in his rookie season now, so saw the end of the mouth era. Lewis Jackson, there you see his numbers. From Portland's point of view, it's important they come away here with points. It's always important, I guess, to come away with points. But when it had so much momentum and uh, has been down here so often in the just a regain the lead, didn't get a big break. From their standpoint, they have to capitalize. Second down at ten. Crofted at the five yard line. Could have had it. It was drilled right in there. Rump took about three steps on a semi roll, pulled up, and nipped it. The Franz in the hole of his own. Here we see the ball approaching Franz, as you can see, a little bit low, but certainly a ball that should be caught. He's normally a very sure handed receiver. Terry Irvin, along with Joe Kinney, the two linebackers, were both converging. And they both come out of the game now on third and ten. 51 seconds left, third quarter. Mouth Davidson, well, down by three. And Portland, right around 50% in these situations on the night. Robinson throws. He read the blitz, but Ross didn't see the pass coming. And it will be fourth down and enters Tim Mazzetti. Hey, Ross was doubled on that, however. Ron Garrison was single covered at the top all alone against Nate Miller. He might have thrown the fade pattern on that one with a better chance of completing it, in my opinion. He could have seen it before the snap, and it was going to be singled all the way on Ron Johnson, who's really been a very effective receiver tonight. Mazzetti has a better average beyond 40 than he's had in the 30 to 39 range. This one will be 31 yards. He got this one. So, Tim Mazzetti with another field goal to make it 20 to 14. And the Breakers do come away with something on a nice drive. After the interception, by score. They got a couple of first downs and we're in position to get three. 20 to 14 our score now. Portland surprising the Denver goal just a bit. There are the Western Conference standings now. Oakland, 11-4-1, but remember, tomorrow they play here on ESPN against New Jersey, and then the following Monday, they have to go to Houston in a game that Houston should perhaps finally need. Denver has Jacksonville left on its schedule, and they will be eagerly awaiting the outcome of that Jacksonville game with Memphis. That game could be meaningful for Jacksonville as well with Denver plays. They're all meaningful. I tried to read all the combinations of who's going to get in the playoffs, and I think what I'll do is wait till the 18th game's over and <laughs> say, those are the eight that are in it. If I was coaching, I'd be figuring out those things out. But, and the teams that are in it, that are already assured a spot, still don't know if they'll have the opportunity to host. Well, that's true. That's another story in itself. You know, one thing, Tim, that I've been very impressed with Mouse Davis' team this year. They are 8-0 and against teams that are under 500. You say, what's so great about that? You have to keep your team sharp to do that, and that's how you win championships. Win the games against the teams you should beat. They're struggling tonight. Lonnie Harris with a three. Tommy Hayes, along with Dwight Beverly, makes the hit for the Breakers. And there are some players that are sprawled out on the field in various and sundry places. That's one of them right there, Terry Irvin. Linebacker. Getting up gingerly, but he's seemingly in good shape. Bob Galliano comes back in, and Johnny Haynes is impressing tonight. There you see, Denver possessions now in the second half. You look at that. Oh, so that's 12. And then you say, well, how'd they score? They picked up a turnover themselves. Joe Herring ran it in. <laughs> oh, he should get at least the assist, right? For him, Bill, who scored. Galliano. Mark Lewis. Had a hand on it. Really dropped it, though. 
before being hit by Bruce Miller, although he may have heard footsteps. Second and ten coming up. Well, the ball's a little bit behind him. I think uh, Galliano expected Lewis to hook up. Lewis read I should run a post pattern. Was thrown a little behind him. Would have been a very fine catch if he caught the ball. Portland secondary, which is playing 90% zone tonight, is doing a super job of converging once that ball is airborne. 28 to 14. 13 seconds are left in the third quarter. Portland leading Denver. Galliano fumbles. Offensive lineman Matt Miller comes up with it. Saves the day for the goal. Gerald Bayless made the hit. Gerald Bayless has been a thorn against the side of the Denver offense tonight. Putting on pressure. Speaking of pressure, Denver down by six as we're through three in Portland. 20 to 14 Portland. The answer to a trivia question, which franchise, professional franchise, has the most cheerleaders? The Breakers. They had heartbreakers in Boston. They had heartbreakers in New Orleans. Now they have heartbreakers in Portland. The most cheerleaders any one franchise has ever had. Third and 15. Galliano. A little lateral to Johnson. He's up to about the 27 yard line. Again, Bayless all over Galliano. I tell you, the front group, the front linemen, are doing such a great job because they're just three rushing with it. Everybody else is covering. Everybody is covering. They're doing a super job of covering. It should give Galliano a lot of time, but that front three is putting great pressure on it. When three men can do it, either they're not protecting or the three men are doing a Herculean job. Ernest Adams and Howard McAdoo made the stop, fourth and 11, and it's punt time for Jim Asman. Dino Hall is about his 35. Catch. A little late fair catch, but it's legal at the 36-yard line. Portland again with good field position. They have a six-point lead. As we resume here, it's second down and five for the Breakers. Jordan is back in the game, dotting the eye behind Matt Robinson. Jackson again gets it. They're up to about the 47-yard line with it. Nevins had made the stop, and they continually give Denver the look that Euclid Jordan will get it, and continually Lewis Jackson is the guy who's carrying the ball. A basic guy playing, he tends to talk more to the tailback than Hartman is doing tonight. Getting occasionally to the fullback, they're doing it more than occasionally. Lewis Jackson, you know, has stepped in for starter Vince Williams, who's also on the injured list, doing a wonderful job tonight. He's one of their top special team players. This guy was a great uh, producer. Uh, Cal Poly and Sam Lewis Abisso, where he holds all of the wrestling records at that school. I do have a first down, and let us not forget that Miles Davis could have been defending Marcus Dupree tonight, and that there are those who believe Dupree may not be able to return to professional football, so his doctors say yes, he can, and Marcus still continually believes that he'll be back in a breaker uniform soon. If the doctor thinks so, that then becomes a bigger thing. Does he think so? Is he willing to do what's necessary? A lot of rehab work. It's lonely hours. Robinson with a pump break. Jackson was held, but he caught it anyway. First down at the 20. number 25 in white. Both players were 25. Covered him. He pumped like a hit. Then Lewis Jackson took off. He had the hip hill beat. Hip hill in closing. He grabbed his shirt tail before they came back onto the picture screen. It was very obvious. Jackson made a fine catch anyway and continues with his starring role for the night. Look at that. 88 rushing yards. 93 in the air. What a factor he's been. First and 10 after 20. But you can still give Thornton a lot of the credit for stopping that play. He'll 
Kenny finally makes a hit. Boy, he did give Joe Kenny the time, though. Thornton totally disrupted the timing on the play, allowed the pursuit to form, and uh, broke down the blocking structure. He was the key man and had his shot to play. But Bruce Thornton is a player that had some image problems, frankly, but has apparently cleared them up since coming over to Denver. Well, Bruce was last last year. He had a little reputation of being overly talkative. He's an intelligent player, he's a fine player, and he's well-intentioned, and he's working hard and having a fine team. He does have great talent. He's second and third team. Robinson for somebody along that line grab a person who was rushing and yank him to the ground. Now whether it was Dan Ross or not, I wouldn't be able to identify it because if the ball was airborne, I'd look down to it. That's him with a helmet off, leaving his case. What is referred to as righteously indignant, I think. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Times was tough for Dan Ross. He played at Northeastern, you might recall, and he's a great talent as well. Draft was second by the Cincinnati Bengals. Had his fine years there, including a performance in the Super Bowl in 1981. Nolan Kranz is in the game, second down at 23 for Portland. Now Robinson just threw that one away. Would like to see grounding. Doug Mitchell was all over him, and Robinson a little shaken. No flag though. Third down at 23 yards to go. That was an extremely costly penalty. Last time they had third, third in a bad ride like this, they hit a touchdown pass. Fans, Alan Fox here taking over the play-by-play -play for Tim Brandon and Marv Levy. It is third down in forever for the Portland Breakers with 10 minutes and 55 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Robinson out of the shotgun looking to throw deep. Needs a first down, but it looks like he's going to fall way short of it as he hits Marion Brown uh, for a small gain. Not enough for a first down, which means the Portland Breakers are going to have to settle for a field goal. Tim Mazzetti will come on to the field and attempt a 40-yard field goal. It's within his range. And if he makes this, he'll put the breakers up by nine points, giving them a little cushion into this fourth quarter. Folks, there was some audio distortion in this game that was recorded on VHS over 30 years ago. That's why I'm doing the play-by-play -play temporarily. We'll be going back to Tim Brando and Marv Levy in the next 20 minutes or so. In the meantime, Nolan Friends holding for Tim Mazzetti, waiting for the snap from center. He bobbles the ball, Mazzetti recovers, and right through the uprights. So Portland goes up by nine points. And as you can see, Mouse Davis nervously pacing on the sideline. How will his team respond? We'll find out when we come back. Portland up 23-14. Sees the kickoff, goes to his left. He trips over his own man. Looks like Walt Downing, but manages to get up and get some more yards. Unbelievable play. Looks like Harris. Yep, there's Downing, who is limping off the field. Number 63, watch as Harris goes to his left. He could have gone upfield behind number 83, but chose to go left and trips right there on his own man. Manages to get up. He was not touched while he was down, so he is allowed to keep going and able to gain some yards. It looks like Harris is down the field hurt. He might have injured that leg. Downing came off the, to the sideline and he was limping as well. Let's take a quick timeout. Portland up 23-14. Alan Fox back here with you. 9.34 left in the game. First and 10 for Denver at their own 22. Gagliano goes back with a play action fake. And he hits Mark Lewis in stride with a wide open play as he heads towards the end zone, but is pushed out of bounds. 
Denver taking advantage of a Portland defensive mistake as you'll see in the replay in a few moments. That will wake the team up. Now State is happy that the offense got going. Let's look at this on the replay because it's not all Bruce Miller's fault. Gagliano, the play action fake, he sees a wide open Lewis and you can see Lewis just runs right through Miller and Miller cannot catch up but from another angle what Miller did, you'll see right here, Miller pushes him towards the inside, expecting help from the other defensive back, but didn't get any, and Miller realizes he's in trouble, and Lewis is off to the races, finally getting pushed out of bounds. Mark Lewis made a great catch on that fake action play. What he did was he widened his route when he went to the inside, knowing he blew by Miller, and was able to get a lot of real estate after that. As you can see, the time remaining in the fourth quarter, Denver has not scored a touchdown pass in this game yet. Looks like there's a small delay with the officials working on the first down markers. They had an issue with it in the first half and they're just attending to it again. Nothing that a little duct tape couldn't take care of. And you see Mark Lewis who made that great catch in that last play. Why don't we take a break while they fix the first down markers. As we uh, continue on with this game, when we come back, Portland up 23-14. Welcome back to Civic Stadium in Portland, Oregon. Portland up 23-14 over the Denver Gold. This is Alan Fox doing the play-by-play -play for you temporarily. It's first down and goal, and the ball's on the eight-yard line for the Denver Gold. Johnson, the lone setback. Leonard Harris in motion to the left. Gagliano hands off to Johnson who barrels through that breaker defense and lands around the three-yard line. Nice little five-yard game there for Johnson. The goal like to run these traps once in a while and as you can see Johnson runs the trap to the left with some key blocks is able to just push his way towards the goal line. Now let's look at the replay. You'll see Yarno in 66 and Loberg in 61 double teaming McAdoo. But Yarno did not need Loberg's help because he was able to open up the hole for Johnson. As you can see, Johnson went right through the hole and closer to the goal line. It's second down and three. This is Bill Johnson's territory because he averages about five yards a carry. So we'll see if they give him the ball as they're close to the goal line. Agriano goes back to throw and throws it on the inside to Mark Lewis. But it's broken up by Bruce Miller. And he says, take that making up for the play before where he got burned. Now you would think they would go to Bill Johnson in that situation since he's been averaging five yards a carry and been moving the ball in the last couple of downs. But they decided to run an inside route with Mark Lewis and the pass was broken up by Bruce Miller. And so now the Denver goal have to decide are they gonna run or are they gonna pass? Bill Johnson must be thinking right now, coach, why didn't you give me the ball? I got you this far. But sometimes with the run and shoot, questionable calls can be made and an opportunity might have been missed. Johnson the lone setback, third and three. Gagliano goes back, goes to his left, looks like he's in trouble. The breaker defense just swarms all over him like a bunch of honeybees led by Needham. That play had no chance whatsoever and Needham was right there. So do you go for it on fourth down or do you kick a field goal? As Needham is celebrating with his defense, a great stop by the breakers as you see Gagliano getting up. This play broke down early, as you can see the pressure from the outside with Storr and all the other defenders, and Gagliano just had no chance, nowhere to throw. Mouse Davis has decided to go for field goal. Asmus will pick from the left hash mark, which will bring him within six. Portland is up right now, 23-14. 23-yard kick. And right through the upright. And so with that field goal, Asnes brings him closer. Within six, Portland up 23-17. Asnes missed two field goals the previous week because he was kicking from the right hash mark, which is not his strong suit. He kicked from the left just now, and he was able to pull it through. As you can see, Dick Corey rallying his team and these fans. He realizes his team just dodged a big bullet by holding Denver to three points. And as you can see now, Dick saying, come on guys, we can close this out. The defense has been playing very well. And listen to these fans, they truly appreciate it.
Corey is telling his offense right now, listen guys, we need to move the ball forward and we need to score. We can't allow Denver to win this game. One thing that we got to give Dick Curry and the whole Portland organization credit for is that, remember, they've moved three times within three years. First it was Boston, then New Orleans, and now Portland. Considering this team has not had a steady or stable home for more than a year, is a testament to this organization and the entire coaching staff. As it's getting ready to kick off, once again, fans, I'm Alan Fox doing the play-by-play -play temporarily due to the fact that there was some distortion on this video that was reported over 30 years ago. We'll be back with Tim Brando and Marv Levy soon. Right now, Jackson returns the kickoff. He heads towards the right, but he is stopped by the Denver special team around the 19-yard line. Portland offense will take over now. Beating the best. That's what Portland has done. They beat Oakland by 13, Memphis by 3, Tampa Bay by 3, and tonight they're beating the Bulls by 6. All four teams are playoff teams. Portland really has improved, especially offensively, with a healthy view for Jordan. Not to mention the defense has been outstanding. Matt Robinson tonight, 15 for 30, 277 yards and one touchdown. Not bad. This offense recently started utilizing the tight end Dan Ross and the other wide receivers such as Marion Brown has really helped improve the team and helped them gain some victories lately. First and 10 at the Portland 19. Jackson and Buford in the backfield. Buford takes the handoff, gains about a couple of yards. He's holding on to that ball very tightly as he did fumble earlier in the game and he doesn't want to make any mistakes right now. John Nevins, the middle linebacker for Denver. As you can see, he lowers his shoulder just enough right about there to push Buford into the inside and only gain a couple of yards. Denver defense knows they got time right now to get that ball back and give their team a chance to win this game. The defensive coaches for Denver are telling them a couple more stops to get the ball back. Robinson brings up his team to the line with a lone setback, Buford Jordan. Portland, second down and eight at their own 21-yard line. Robinson back to pass. Batted down by Pat Ogren, the right tackle. Nice defensive play. You hear a lot about Calvin Turner and Bruce Thornton, who are excellent pass rushers, but it's uh, Ogren who's one of the leading tacklers on this defensive team. Right now, Robinson is trying to figure this out because this offense is stalling. And with six and a half minutes left, they need to first down. Third and eight. Tight end Dan Ross is part of a split setback along with Jackson. Again, third and eight. They need a first down. Robinson back to pass. Look to his right. There's flags on the play. He's looking for Marion Brown, but Henfield breaks it up. There are flags on the play. Hempel actually recovered a fumble for a touchdown early in the game, but let's see find out what the flag is. Number 99 on the defense. You can hear that audio distortion. That's why I'm doing the play-by-play. -play. Calvin Turner, the defensive end, got caught with encroachment. His hand or his head gear must have been in the neutral zone, and that's why the referee called it. What bad timing for that penalty to happen for Turner and the Denver defense because now instead of a punt, it's third and three and Portland has a chance to get a first down and move the chain. Looks like Buford Jordan is coming in along with Bill Winters and the 6-1, the offensive lineman who could line up as a tight end along with Dan Ross. They're bringing in the short yardage personnel. You see the yards penalized there, Denver 4 for 25, Portland 5 for 42, but it's on this drive where Denver has shot themselves in the foot, giving the Portland offense a lifeline. Split backfield, Buford and Jackson, third and three. Jackson takes the handoff, heads to his left. Nice block by Buford Jordan, and Jackson tippy toes to the first down marker. Nice block by Buford Jordan, which allowed Jackson to use his speed and get that first down. Watch this replay, as you will see. Watch Jordan make a key block right about there, which frees up Jackson to tippy-toe his way down the sideline for a first down. Nice move. Let's look at it from another angle. Now, Buford Jordan will be leading the play. He'll be cutting down the inside blitz right about there, which again frees up Jackson to just tippy-toe down the sideline and get that first down. Nice play by both Buford and Jackson. 
Jackson is nine yards shy of the 100 yard mark for the game. It's first and 10, short of the 30 yard line. Portland up by six. Robinson, play fake, looking downfield. And he hits Ron Johnson for a first down. Portland moving the ball effectively now. It's a well-timed pattern. It looks like Portland is now working the underneath route. And if Denver wants to get the ball back anytime soon, they're going to need to put a line back on these receivers. Dick Corey did state that the addition of Ron Johnson and Marion Brown has been productive and are two reasons why the Breakers have been winning lately. Mouse Davis is probably wondering when his defense is going to give him the ball back. Portland has been moving the ball effectively ever since that penalty from Calvin Turner on defense. Gave him a third and three and they were able to get the first down. Right now it's first and ten at their own 45. Five minutes and 50 seconds left in the ball game. Denver has all three timeouts. Breakers have won. Jackson takes it up the middle all the way to the Denver 46 yard line. It's about a nine yard gain. It should give him 100 yards for the night. He's been penetrating to that Denver defense all game long. He's helped the Portland offense move the ball on this drive and keep the clock going. And there it is, 100 yards, 20 rushes. As the clock ticks away with less than five minutes left in the game. Portland needs a first down here to keep the clock rolling. They could run and play action pass and get the couple of yards they need. But again, in this situation, at this time, you really need to be creative. Lewis Jackson, the lone setback. They need about a yard for the first down. Jackson takes the handoff, but is stopped behind the line by Thornton, who came barreling through. Looks like somebody missed the tackle. And let's look at it again. Dan Hurley. As you can see, gives him a little elbow, but that's not good enough to stop Thornton. Thornton came right through and stopped Jackson in his tracks, which now means it's third and two. And Dick Corey has to come up with another play to get the first down and keep the clock rolling. The Denver defense needs to stop here desperately because Mouse Davis knows that the clock is starting to become his enemy. You can see there, now less than four minutes, and he's probably wondering when he's gonna have to start using those timeouts. It's third and two. Jackson and Buford in the backfield. Jackson takes the handoff, and he's off and running, getting a first down. Great blocking by the offensive line. You're gonna see that they ran pretty much the same play as the one before. They took a chance. Watch the blocking, it's the same play as before where Hurley missed the block, but this time they opened up the hole and Jackson was able to get the first down. Look at it from another angle. Everybody's covered, even the outside linebacker is taken out of the play, and you'll see right there, Jackson was able to squeeze through, and Dick Corey's gamble worked out. Now the Portland sideline is starting to feel it as there's about three minutes left in the game. You see Jackson in the backfield. One more first down and the Denver defense is gonna have to start using their timeouts. It's first and 10. Buford Jordan takes the handoff, goes to the left, and he pounds right through Steve Tremble. Tremble uh, holding on for dear life as Jordan imposed his will on him. Look at this replay, you'll see it from another angle. Right here, Thornton just touches him slightly and here comes uh, Trimble he's just holding on for dear life as Jordan gains six yards Trimble might need a medic after that play Portland has drained five minutes off the clock through their running game and as you can see Mouse Davis is gonna have to start thinking when am I gonna use the timeout as you can see the clock running we're coming up on two minute mark second and four for Portland Jackson and Buford in a double setback let's see what Portland has in mind looks like a run play Jackson takes the handoff, goes to the left, but Nate Miller and Kilkenny stop him at the line. And now Denver will take a timeout before the two-minute warning, so Mouse Davis is looking at it like, I got an extra timeout. Portland is forcing Denver to use its timeouts, but unless the Denver defense could come up with a stop, it's going to be for nothing. As right now, it's third and four, and Portland, all they have to do is kick a field goal, and they pretty much ice this game. And Dick Corey knows it. Folks, again, due to audio distortion in this game, I, Alan Fox, am doing the play-by-play -play temporarily. As you can see the timeout there, Denver has two and Portland has one. But in reality, with the two-minute warning, Denver has that extra timeout when they come back on the field.
Once again, USFL fans, my name is Alan Fox. I'm doing the play-by-play -play temporarily due to audio distortion on this video that was recorded over 30 years ago. We'll be joining Tim Brando and Marv Levy towards the end of the game. Right now, I want to tell you, if you want to watch USFL games from 1983 to 1985, go to our USFL Forever channel. You will find all the regular season games from 83 to 85, including the playoffs and all three championship games, as well as weekly highlights, interviews, and much more. And once again, that's on our USFL Forever YouTube channel, as well as our USFL Forever Facebook page, where we have more content that you won't see on our YouTube channel. So again, join us on USFL Forever YouTube and USFL Forever Facebook page. Right now, Portland is leading Denver by six with a little over two minutes left, and if Portland can get a first down right now, they can steal this game. Keep in mind here, folks, that Dick Curry might be hesitant to kick a field goal in this situation due to the fact that they've been mishandling the snap on the field goals. Nolan France has fumbled a couple of them, and uh, they might not want to take that risk because it might be blocked or taken back for a touchdown. It's important that the Portland offense gets a first down here. As you see, two minutes and eight seconds to go with the two-minute warning coming up. It's third and three, double setback. Hand off to Jordan. Jordan goes to the left and he has stopped at the line of scrimmage. They did not get the first down, which means now they're gonna be forced to try to kick a field goal. It's the two minute warning. Can Portland hold on? We'll find out when we come back. They're up 23, 17. Alan Fox back here with you in Portland. The Breakers are trying to extend their lead to nine as Mazzetti's gonna attempt a field goal. There's been issues with the snap and the hold by France in the last two field goal attempts. The Breakers definitely need to get this one. Otherwise, Denver will take over at the spot of the kick and will have two minutes to win the game. The snap, the hold, and it is no good, no good. So now it'll be up to the Portland defense to stop Denver from scoring and winning this game. It looked like Nolan France mishandled the snap. Let's look at it. And yes, right about there. He fumbles it and then didn't put the ball down in time. And Mazzetti, he just kicked it to the left and uh, nothing he can do to fix it. Here's another angle. The snap from the center looked good, but France mishandled it and couldn't put the ball down on time and so Mazzetti shanked it to the left. And so now, the Denver offense is uh, going on the move and has an opportunity to win this game. They're down by six. It'll be first and 10 for the Denver offense at their own 19. Bill Johnson, the lone setback. Leonard Harris in motion to the left. Gagliano goes back to pass, looks towards his left. He finds Lonnie Turner, who gets tackled by Lindell Jones at the Denver 35. The clock does stop under two minutes in each half in the USFL, don't forget. On the replay, you'll see three receivers at the top of your screen. Lonnie Turner just happens to hook in underneath, and Gagliano finds him for the first down. First and 10 for Denver at their own 35. Stiegel in motion to the right. Gagliano goes back, throws a slam pass to Harris, who goes up to the 44-yard line, close to a first down. Dwight Taylor for the breakers makes the stop. Denver now in a hurry-up offense with two timeouts left. They do have time on this drive. Gagliano calling the signal. Stiegel in motion to the right. Gagliano hands off to Johnson who goes to his left and finds a nice opening all the way to the 45 yard line. 10 yards for Johnson on that run. And once again, the hurry up offense. 115 left on the clock, but with two timeouts, they got plenty of time with this drive. A touchdown will tie the game and a field goal will win it. The Breakers defense trying to hold on. Harris in motion to the left, first and 10. Denver at the Portland 45. Galliano goes back, throws a sidearm pass to Harris. Not much gain there. It'll be second down and 10 for Denver at the Portland 45. The gold on the move with 105 left in the game. USFL fans will be turning the game over back to Tim Brandon and Marv Levy. I'm Alan Fox. It's been a pleasure doing the play-by-play -play for you. Don't forget, USFL fans, if you want to watch all the games from the 1983 to 1985 USFL seasons, you can go to our USFL Forever YouTube channel and watch all the games there.
And now here's Tim Brandon, Mark Levy. Second down, 10. At the 46 of the Portland, the Eagle goes in motion. There he is. The Eagle's got it. Edge is the grass is out of bounds at the 41. So, it will be third down. In the passing situation, of course, with the running two, it's always passing situation. There is. Every situation is the same. Yeah, with the running two. Bill Rettig, if he could have made that back when he kept Steve in bounds, would have held him. But again, I do not think that the clock is a factor that's going to stop Denver here. They're either going to store it down for them, they're going to run out of down to lose the ball. And I know we have a malfunctioning clock now. What a time for that, huh? Yeah. That may take the wind out of the fields of Denver just a bit. That makes them stop anyway. Well, this is one of those things that I've always felt is that if it happens, let's not think, does this help us or help them? What's going to make the difference is how we play and how they play. Don't look for a reason why we would have won if the block had malfunctioned or if it had the rain or if it was too late then the drove. Go out and play with the game. Earn it. Everyone's looking for distraction, right? Everyone's always looking for distraction. Third down and six. The fans trying to become a distraction now. 59 seconds are left on the clock. Galliano quickly calls for and gets the timeout. 53 seconds now left. They flooded the right side. Ridden to the left. Came back and Mark Lewis came inside from his wide position. Found a crease in the zone. Tries to hit that field. He doesn't go straight down the field. He comes inside looking for that crease in the zone. See if he can't go any deeper. So he hooks up. Now I'm going to go deep with the ball. Looks fast, throws in there by a defensive linebacker in the blue shirt, brings him down, but they're 25 yards away, and they got 53 seconds, and the timeout to work with. There you see the timeout left. One, three, six. 23 to 14, the breakers leading. Lewis again. Out of bounds at about the 11 yard line and 48 six are left on the clock. This is the key guy, Mark Lewis. They sent Moulton away from Lewis as they got single coverage. Bruce Miller and Lewis. Miller wasn't going to let it go deep. Gave the pitch cushion. Lewis ran an out cut. Wow, I don't know about that second foot now. I don't know about it, but there's no red flag left. <laughs> Take a look, Harry Lynn striding out there. One, two, it's down, it's down. Remember now, Denver, three times a week ago against Houston in the first half. Inside the 20, fails to score. Here they are again, this time in the Pacific Northwest. Down by six. Galliano Ruiz knocked away by Miller. They had it. Galliano comes out, starts out, he's all alone, single, going in center field. Falls a little bit behind it. Miller's fighting for his life. Certainly didn't give up. That is your way. Here we see, look at that center field there. Lewis had a straight up field on it. That's the fun. That's the fun. Second and ten. The ball just outside the 11. 44 seconds left. Knocked away and nearly intercepted. Jeff Merrill. Jeff Merrill got a hand on it. Out of the town. Diana turned the sprint right to Gil Siegel at the last moment. And whether he would have gotten it or not, it ain't much different. Fourth and seven. Oh! 
Valley at all. Incomplete. Knocked away by Rustic. This is a 5 and 11 team, ladies and gentlemen, and the party is on. You think it's that important to win even though you don't have a chance in the playoffs? Back to now, he looks for 88, Mark Lewis. No one wasn't there now, he's looking. 45 also. Johnny Hayes got his hand in there as well. Mount Davis watching it. Red ball in nature of it. Tremendously disappointing. It will be the second week in a row that a running two team was lost. Did not have a touchdown pass. Dick Corey's team has really shown its will. He's a player's coach. And his players are happy. Well, Mouses do. They like him. They have reason to. The loss today, they'll go back to work tomorrow and get ready for that jacket. Breakers have scored another upset. Their third win in four weeks. The former quarterback under Pat Leahy in Notre Dame showed a little of the final Irish within his team tonight. 23-17. It was a dandy tonight in Portland. They beat Denver. Dick Corey got from Boston to New Orleans. Now it's the hockey nation in Portland.